Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, we're just going to get started in just about another minute. So thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Maggie Howell and I am the Executive Director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Uh, today we are joined by John Benson, who is generously offered to discuss his research on hybridization dynamics between eastern wolves and coyotes. Uh, John is an Assistant Professor in Vertebrate Ecology at the University of Nebraska. John did his PhD at Trent University in Ontario, Canada, where he studied hybridization between wolves and coyotes. And John has since continued to collaborate on research with wolves and coyotes in Ontario. John also does research on wolves in other areas, as well as mountain lions, white sharks, mule deer, and other species. Most of John's work involves studying population dynamics, behavior, interactions between genetics and demography in threatened populations or with hunted species of management concern. So um, a little uh, housekeeping before we get started. If you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel, and we'll provide time for questions at the end of John's talk. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to turn the time over to John now. So thank you, John. OK, yeah, thanks, Maggie. Thanks for inviting me to give this presentation. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, the internet's a crazy place, so I hope uh, hope everyone enjoys the talk. Um, I'm John Benson, as Maggie said, and I'm going to talk about hybridization dynamics between wolves and coyotes in Ontario, Canada. And this is largely from work I did as a PhD student while I was at Trent University with my PhD advisor, Brent Patterson, who is a research scientist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry up in Peterborough, Ontario. But it wasn't just Brett and I that, that did all the work I'm going to show you here today. We had a number of colleagues um, that are also co-authors on the publications that, um, that came from the work I'm going to talk about today. And that includes Tyler Wielden, um, who helped us a lot with a lot of the genetics work. Ken Mills, who did his master's at Trent before I arrived and did a lot of the early pup survival work. Karen Loveless, who did a lot of work on predation by eastern wolves and other canids in Algonquin. And Linda Rutledge, who's done a huge amount of genetics work on eastern canids and uh, particularly eastern wolves um, throughout the time that I've been working on wolves as well. And then finally, Peter Mahoney, a colleague of mine who at the time was at Utah State and helped us with a couple of the papers that came out of the work I'm going to show you today. So um, jumping right into it, many of you probably know this, but in Ontario, we have a really diverse assemblage of canids. So we have gray wolves, we have eastern wolves, and we have eastern coyotes. And one thing I should mention right off the bat is you may have heard the term Algonquin wolf, or you may hear that in the future. And Ontario now calls um, what I'm calling eastern wolves Algonquin wolves. And so I just want to make it clear that Algonquin wolves and eastern wolves are the same entity. Um, but for simplicity, I'm going to refer to them as eastern wolves, which is the way that we refer to them in the past. The other thing I should note that, again, a lot of you are probably well uh, quite familiar with is that these animals have complicated and, and often very controversial evolutionary histories, and there's a, quite a bit of uncertainty about their evolutionary origins and their taxonomic classification. We're not going to, we're going to try not to get bogged down in that today, and we really don't have time uh, to, to go through all that's involved in, in that, but the bottom line is that we absolutely recognize there's been extensive gene flow between wolves and coyotes in Ontario. And so when I refer 
to the animals as gray wolves or eastern wolves or coyotes, that's not meant to imply that they're necessarily pure versions of their ancestral genomes. Again, we recognize there's been extensive gene flow. And I also want to point out that our focus with this work was very much on ecology rather than taxonomy. So we did the work in and around Algonquin Park in Ontario, Canada. So Algonquin Park would be the black uh, polygon there in the circle. Um, and that's, for those of you tuning in from the States, that will be right above Western New York State. And then if we zoom into that study area, what you can see here is four dashed line polygons within which we studied wolves, coyotes, and hybrids. And so starting with APP, that's Algonquin Provincial Park, that same polygon we saw on the previous map. And actually the white boundary there is the actual park boundary for Algonquin. And then the dark gray shaded area surrounding that um, is an area within which, so it's the park and a buffer area around it within which um, wolves, coyotes, and hybrids, all canids, are completely protected from shooting and trapping. And so that's the large protected area, but then we also studied wolves, coyotes, and hybrids in three units out in the white areas there, um, which are largely unprotected, and that includes Wildlife Management Unit 47, Wildlife Management Unit 49 directly west, and the Kawartha Highlands directly south of the park. So thinking about eastern wolf conservation, and so we obviously wanted to understand these hybridization dynamics, but a lot of our focus was trying to understand what it meant for eastern wolf conservation. Currently, eastern wolves are listed as threatened, and so they're recognized as threatened by Kosiwik federally in Canada, and also provincially in Ontario. And the, the need for the listing or the impetus for the listing is largely due to their extremely restricted distribution. The fact that they readily hybridize with both gray wolves and coyotes when they come into contact. And also there's a lot of concern about human cause mortality. The goals of our study were, I think, pretty ambitious. And we really wanted to, to try to gain a comprehensive understanding of this hybrid zone between wolves and coyotes. And so, with that in mind, we tried to investigate the genetic, morphologic, demographic, and behavioral structure of this Canis hybrid zone. And again, really, we wanted to start to understand what hybridization means for wolf conservation, and particularly for eastern wolf conservation in Ontario. And so prior to our study, there were quite a number of, of previous Canis hybridization studies in Ontario and elsewhere. And they were largely focused on taxonomy and evolutionary history. And most of these were lab-based genetic studies. And in most cases, little was known, unfortunately, about the animals that were sampled. A lot of the samples came from dead animals, either animals that were trapped or hit on the road or, or died from other reasons. And obviously, it's pretty difficult to study ecology when the animal is already dead. So with that in mind, with our study, what we wanted to do was to ask, do these genetic differences that have been documented in some of the previous genetic studies actually add up to anything morphologically and ecologically? And with that, we, we hope to really start to gain an understanding of the biological significance of hybridization between wolves and coyotes. And so real quick on some of the lab and, and field methods, um, we captured a relatively large number of individual wolves, coyotes, and hybrids across that study area I showed you. Each one got some type of GPS and VHF tracking device. Mostly these are radio collars, but we also visited dens, captured four-week-old pups, and, and implanted these pups with VHF tracking devices with the help of veterinarians. And then I and we tracked these animals intensively on the ground and from the air. And we also did a, quite an intensive genetic study. So all these animals that we captured, um, we also got genotypes. We used 12 microsatellite loci, and we also examined Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA haplotypes. Okay, so jumping right into some genetic results. So starting with the genetic structure of the hybrid zone. What we've got here is a principal components plot. And each one of those little colored circles with the line extending into the center of the clusters, each one of those circles represents an individual resident canid. And they're arranged along these axes of genetic variation based on their microsatellite allele data. And so it's a way to visualize genetic differences 
what we've got here are three clusters, three distinct Canis types that are clustering as putative gray wolves, which are Great Lakes types gray wolves, similar to the gray wolves that we have in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin and the Great Lakes states. Eastern wolves shown in green and eastern coyotes. And so you can see within our study area, we do have three distinct Canis types genetically, but it, this graph is actually a little misleading. I intentionally withheld part of the data set and now you're seeing the full data set. I wanted to show you those distinct clusters so we could see um, each of the three main Canid types. But with this plot, now we see that there are also admixed individuals. So these are hybrids between the three distinct types of Canids we have. And so you can see they're intermediate genetically in between those three clusters of gray wolves, eastern wolves, and eastern coyotes. So that's a little bit about the types of animals we have. So we have, we do have a large number of animals that are highly assigned to one of those genetic clusters, either eastern coyotes, eastern wolves, or the Great Lakes type wolves. So that's what they look like genetically. But here we'll try to put faces to the names. And remember, we wanted to, to go further and ask, well, do these genetic differences really mean anything morphologically? And so taking a look at, at these canids morphologically, we'll start with the eastern coyotes. They're the smallest canids in the hybrid zone. And they're the smallest canids in, in the hybrid zone, but they're actually, these are pretty big coyotes, right? So what I'm showing here are uh, mean body weights in kilograms for uh, females and males. Obviously canids are sexually dimorphic, such that males on average are bigger than females. But those are the mean body weights for the eastern coyotes. And then slightly larger than the eastern coyotes are the hybrids between eastern wolves and eastern coyotes. And you can see their body weights are slightly larger. These differences in body size are relatively subtle, um, but they were actually significantly different when we analyzed them statistically. Larger still than the hybrids would be the eastern wolves. And as we, start, as we go through these, you can start to see some changes in the features as well. Unfortunately, we can't see the paws. The paws do increase in size from relatively narrow paws in the, the eastern coyotes, intermediate and hybrids, and larger in the wolves. But you can see in the head, here with these hybrids you're seeing, um, you can still see them retaining those coyote features of the longer, pointier ears and the long muscles, but their heads are quite a bit bigger than the eastern coyotes. And as we get into the wolves, we see their heads being bigger still, large wolf-like head, and a reduction in the muzzle and ears. Um, so less of a coyote look there to the eastern wolves and again larger body size and then here's a class that i'm calling here admix gray wolves and again these are the great lakes type gray wolves um, and so we had smaller numbers of these in our study area so i'm just showing a range of their body weights but they were in fact larger um, the largest canids in the hybrid zone and larger even than the eastern wolves So this map here, again, shows that same study area I've already showed you, but now we're looking at essentially the spatial genetic structure of this hybrid zone. Basically, where are these different types of um, wolves and coyotes and hybrids distributed on the landscape? So in this map, each one of these circles represents, again, an individual resident canid plotted approximately on their home range centroid based on the GPS tracking data. And I've color coded them each with a different color for the three main types. So eastern wolves in green, coyotes in red, and the uh, Great Lakes gray wolves in blue. And then any individuals that are admixed or hybrids between two or even three classes have two or even three colors. What you can see, I think quite quickly, is that it doesn't look like a random assemblage of the different types, right? And I think what jumps out, first of all, is that most of the green dots, most of the eastern wolves are found within Algonquin Park. And most of the canids within the park are in fact eastern wolves shown in green. As you come out of the park directly west, you can see that it changes very quickly as you leave the park boundary and the boundary of the, the harvest band there. And it goes from mostly green to mostly red and a few hybrids. So we see a steep genetic climb from mostly eastern wolves in the park to mostly coyotes and hybrids just to the west. I, I led the research in, in Wildlife Management Unit 49 in an uh, Algonquin Park, but luckily Brent was also conducting research to the northwest in management unit 47 and also south of the park in the Kaorthas. You can imagine if we only had data from 49 in Algonquin, we'd have a very different impression of the genetic structure of this hybrid zone. Um, but if we look in 47 and in the Kaorthas, 
we see a more balanced mix of wolves, coyotes, and hybrids outside of Algonquin than we do in Management Unit 49, for instance. And so we actually did document resident breeding eastern wolves in both 47 and the Corthas. And in fact, there's one right in the heart of Wildlife Management Unit 49 there as well, but they're quite rare in 49. Um, but we do find um, a fairly balanced mix of wolf, coyotes, and hybrids in 47 in the Corthas. So an obvious question coming out of that map is, well, what's driving that non-random pattern, that, that spatial distribution of the different genotypes on the landscape? And so to get at this, we constructed some landscape genetic models. And basically what we did here is we're asking the question, well, what environmental features, what landscape features explain the variation in individual resident canes that we see with respect to wolf and coyote ancestry? And so this model, the uh, explanatory variables that we, we looked at were things to do with prey density, which obviously influences wolves and coyotes but also a human presence, um, and we included road densities. And so the top model, most of the variation between wolf and coyote ancestry in these animals was explained by differences in moose density, secondary road density, and tertiary road density. And so secondary roads are intermediate sized paved roads, so not major highways, but paved roads, and then tertiary roads are dirt roads and trails. So if we look at these two graphs here, um, the first graph there, on the y-axis we have coyote ancestry, so increasing coyote ancestry up the y-axis, and increasing moose density on the x-axis. What you can see is a negative relationship where as you get into areas of more and more moose density in the study area, you see less and less coyote ancestry in the individual resident canids. An easier way to think about that might be in areas with more moose, we saw more wolf ancestry in the resident canids. Moving over to the next graph, um, here again we have coyote ancestry on the y-axis and secondary road density on the x-axis. And you can see a generally positive but slightly non-linear effect where as you get into areas of higher human presence and more roads, we see more and more coyote ancestry in the individual resident canids. And so these were important results both to start to understand again that distribution spatial distribution of the genotypes across the landscape, different canids, but also it lines up well with what we know about wolf and coyote ancestry in terms of wolves being associated with large prey, coyotes being associated or at least assumed to be able to um, do better around humans and higher road densities. Um, and so in addition to giving us some information about what's driving that spatial genetic structure, um, it also gives us some reassurance that our genetic inferences are on track. Okay, so, so far we've looked at what the animals are genetically, what they look like a little bit morphologically, where they are on the landscape, and a bit about what's driving that. But next we wanted to move on to start to understand demography and, and particularly survival and reproduction. And I'm going to show you some results about survival today. We'll start with survival of adults and yearlings. And so these are all age classes, but not pups, right? So not, not first year survival, adults and yearlings. And so what we did here is we estimated annual survival and we're attempting to understand factors that influence survival or the reverse of that, which would be mortality risk. And so we did that in a couple ways. We started by looking in Algonquin Park. Um, in the protected area, basically we didn't find that anything was strongly influencing survival of wolves, coyotes, and hybrids in Algonquin. And in fact, there weren't differences in survival among the different canid types. Now, as you saw on the map, most of the animals in the park were in fact Eastern wolves, but there were some hybrids and there also were a couple of coyotes. Um, but basically they all survived quite well. Annual survival was 85% and they, they survived quite well. So they're protected, they're surviving well, and we couldn't identify anything that was really driving greater or lesser mortality risk. Now we move outside of the park and it's a very different story. And so here we do see differences between the different canid types with respect to survival. And what we found actually is that Eastern wolves survive poorly outside of Algonquin. Now I just want to stop for a second and say, obviously Eastern wolves outside of the park survive poorly relative to Eastern wolves inside of the park. That's, that's pretty much a no brainer. If you protect them, they're going to survive better. But even outside of the park, eastern wolves survive poorly relative to the other canid types, the eastern coyotes, 
the coyote eastern wolf hybrids and these admixed gray wolves that they were living side by side with outside of the protected area. So outside of Algonquin, for some reason, eastern wolves are surviving poorly relative to the other canid types. And you can see in the table there, they came in at just under 40% annual survival for the eastern wolves outside of Algonquin. The other canid types range from 55 to 66% survival. And so our analyses estimated that eastern wolves were about two times more likely to die than other canids outside of Algonquin, than the eastern coyotes, the hybrids, and the admixed gray wolves. And this is being driven by human caused mortality. They were actually three and a half times more likely to end up shot or trapped than the other canids. And so that's foreshadowing this next slide where we're looking, that was just overall survival mostly, but now we're looking at specific causes of mortality. And so for this table here, I've got it broken down again into protected and unprotected. So protected would be Algonquin and the surrounding buffer area. And what we see for causes of death in Algonquin, um, quite nice, we see no harvest mortality, so no trapping and shooting mortality, which is great. It means that the people were following the rules. Um, we see a relatively modest level of natural mortality. Um, a few were killed by vehicles and, and a few that were unknown that we couldn't determine cause of death for. Then we move to the unprotected landscape, and here's again where we see the big difference. So outside of the park, about 24% annual uh, mortality rate due to shooting and trapping, and that rate was considerably higher and significantly higher than the other causes, the natural mortality, the vehicles, and the ones that we couldn't determine. Um, and so the leading cause of death, the take home message here is the leading cause of death in the study area outside of Algonquin was shooting and trapping at about 24% annually. And our analyses again showed that Eastern wolves were more likely to be harvested than the other canids. And another result we had um, is that wolves that are dispersing as opposed to being a resident wolf were also more likely to be harvested, um, shot or trapped. And so that's really kind of double whammy if you're thinking about um, the potential for Eastern wolves to disperse out of Algonquin and establish outside of the park. They're more likely to die and be shot and trapped because they're dispersing um, rather than being residents. And they're also more likely to die because they're Eastern wolves. And so those two things don't add up um, to being very favorable for expansion of Eastern wolves outside of Algonquin um, in the adjacent landscape. So continuing on with, with mortality, uh, we had an interesting interaction between an environmental variable which are roads, secondary roads again, and genetic ancestry. And so what this graph is showing you, on the y-axis we have annual survival from zero to one, and on the x-axis we have increasing secondary road densities. And then what we see is for each of the four Canis types, which are again color-coded, coyotes, coyote eastern wolf hybrids, admixed gray wolves, and eastern wolves, um, we see that all of them survive significantly worse as you go into areas of higher road density. But we see that Eastern wolves in particular survive quite a bit worse than the other three types. Shown in black, you can see their survival really declines precipitously as you get into areas of, of more and more roads. And so as we saw before, the main cause of death is shooting and trapping. There were a few that were killed by vehicles, but really the effect of secondary roads on mortality here is more about access for hunting and trapping than it is about about vehicles. And for some reason, again, eastern wolves appear to be very susceptible to human disturbance and human caused mortality. So humans are clearly influencing the structure of the hybrid zone and hybrid zone fitness in the sense of who survives better, um, eastern wolves or the other canid types. And so obviously we're interested to know why that is. And the short answer is we, we don't know, we can't be sure. But I think the simplest explanation is maybe that their eastern wolves are quite a bit more naive to harvest risk. So we don't think there's anything intrinsically inferior about eastern wolves. It makes more sense that you saw the, the map with all the green dots in the park. Most of the eastern wolves in the area probably originate at some point from Algonquin Park. Even the ones that we're tracking outside of the park may have dispersed out from the park, or perhaps their parents did. So a lot of these eastern wolves may have been raised in a protected area, and they're simply naive to the dangers that, that humans pose 
naive to the dangers that roads pose and perhaps more susceptible um, to shooting and trapping. And, and that's possibly the explanation for our results. Regardless of the exact explanation, clearly this is an important demographic mechanism underlying the observed structure of the hybrid zone that we saw, where we have a lot of eastern wolves inside the park where they survive quite well, and they're much fewer and patchily distributed outside of the park where they survive quite poorly. Okay, so we've seen that roads are really important um, in terms of influencing mortality of canids. And so we wanted to look at the behavioral response of these canids to roads. So the, the GPS collars and the VHF collars, they gave us a lot of great information about survival, but we're also getting a lot of information about where they are uh, multiple times a day. So we wanted to look at their, um, their movement behavior relative to roads. And so we've seen that roads can be bad for all canids by increasing their mortality risk. But we also think there could be good things about roads for wolves and coyotes. And this may pose a bit of a trade-off between the costs and the benefits for roads. So what would the benefits be? Well, certainly easier traveling during winter. Um, there's, there can be food associated with roads. So whether it's um, food at a dump or guts piles from hunted animals during hunting season. Um, so it could be a food source for wolves and coyotes. And so there may be some benefits to being around roads, but we've clearly seen the negatives as well. So we asked a few questions about this to try to get a better understanding of their behavior. And the first question was, do canids select roads more at night? So are they closer to roads more at night and maybe farther during the day? Um, basically, if there's a benefit to being near roads, maybe they use roads at night um, and avoid them during the day when they'd be more likely to actually encounter a human. And this has been shown in other, other studies, and I'll give you the punchline right away. Yes, at the population level, we saw that response. Basically, um, we saw them much closer to roads at night than they were during the day. But then we asked a couple more questions. So this change in behavior between day and night, being closer to roads at night and farther during the day, we predicted that that might increase at higher road density, where it would be more adaptive, and you'd have a higher risk of running into humans um, we, we expected to see that day-night change to be quite a bit stronger. That was the first question. And then the second question, we took it one step further and said, okay, well, if they're changing their behavior between day and night and doing so more in areas where there's a lot of roads and a lot of humans, are they actually getting a benefit out of it? Um, does it influence their mortality risk? In other words, if you change your behavior and avoid those roads really strongly during the day, um, can you expect to actually have a lower mortality risk as a result. And to get at this, we constructed some resource selection function models, um, taking a Bayesian approach with uh, random slopes. And the importance of these random slopes is, basically this model allows us to go beyond just population level response to roads, but it also allows us to estimate individual level response of the radio colored canids to any environmental, uh, environmental variable in this case, we were interested in the roads. So how do individual canids respond to roads? Then we could link that with their individual survival, their life and death, and also um, whether they were in a territory with more or fewer roads to test our questions here. And so getting at that second question, so we already saw at the population level, yes, they change their behavior between day and night, but do they do so more often um, or more strongly when they have a lot of roads in their territory. So these graphs might look a little crazy at first, but it's actually not that bad. So on the, the y-axis, what we've got is a change in their behavior between day and night. So a high value means, yes, they're strongly changing their behavior to avoid roads more strongly during the day. And then as you go down the y-axis, basically lower values mean that, that that change in behavior disappears. On the x-axis, we've got road density. It's a little weird because it's distance-based road density, but you can see I've labeled it. You go from high to road density across that x-axis. And so we've got the same pattern coming through for both winter and summer. Basically what you can see here is that yes, they really strongly change their behavior between day and night in areas of the highest road density. And then that effect disappears as you get into more remote areas with fewer roads. So our second question is addressed here. We are seeing that behavior and they're modifying that behavior based on the road density within their territories. But did it influence mortality risk? 
did they get anything from, from exhibiting that behavior? And so to get at this question, I separated the animals with radio collars that lived from the ones that died. And it turned out that it was about half and half in our data set. And then I re-estimated this relationship. And so you can see in the first graph, these are the animals that survived. And you can see that relationship gets even stronger. So they're really strongly changing their behavior between day and night at high road densities. And once again, it largely disappears as you get into more remote areas. But if you go to the other graph, these are the canids that died and they show no significant effect. So they're not changing their behavior between day and night relative to road density. And they appear to be paying a higher mortality risk as a cost. And so this was pretty interesting to us. Um, and again, highlighted that trade-off between being around humans. And it, it sort of indicates that some animals are acting adaptively and have figured out how to live around roads and do so successfully and some don't, and, and they often pay a cost for that. Okay, so that's a lot about survival and a little bit about behavior. Those are all adults and yearlings wearing uh, radio collars. Now we're gonna talk a bit about pup survival. So we also learned a lot about the survival of pups. And we did so by visiting dens, catching the pups at about four weeks old, um, tagging them with these VHF transmitters, and then we could track them throughout their first year of life to document survival and mortality. I mentioned Ken at the, at the beginning. So Ken Mills um, was a master's student working with Brent um, up at Trent. And he started this pup work in 2004 and 2005 in Algonquin Park. And importantly, um, he did most of his pup tracking in the eastern portion of the park. I followed up in 2008, 2009, and 2010 and I captured and tracked pups in Management Unit 49, and again in Algonquin, but I worked mainly in the western portion of the park. And between the two studies, we ended up catching a total of 159 pups. These were from 52 litters from 33 different packs, and so obviously we caught multiple litters from some packs across different years. And I thought people might be interested just to take a look at what these dens look like. Um, so the most common dens were tunnels into the ground. And we um, had the, uh, the pleasure or displeasure, I guess, depending on how you look at it, of climbing into these dens and crawling in to catch the pups. And got some pretty cool pictures from some of them. And a lot of them, actually, I don't have a picture from the outside, but the most common tunnel dens are actually burrowed into banks along either beaver ponds or sloughs. It'd be a little bit of a slope and the wolves would actually um, burrow right into that bank. Sometimes like this picture here, they were literally holes in the ground. Sometimes they were underneath tree roots like this one. And then the second most common type of den would be rock dens. And so these were either involving cliff faces or big boulders and they would have their pups um, within crevices or little caves in between these boulders. So back to the, the survival study though, this table here, I've got three study areas, um, three areas where we tracked pups. So Eastern Algonquin, largely done by Ken and his work, Western Algonquin, which I followed up with, and then Wildlife Management Unit 49. And we put all the data together um, and published a paper on this. And what you can see here are some pretty striking differences, particularly within the two portions of Algonquin. So first year pup survival in Eastern Algonquin was very high, about 75%. Um, so first year survival for a, a wild wolf population, that's pretty good. Um, now we expected to see reasonably high survival inside a large protected area. What's a little unexpected is the low pup survival in Western Algonquin. So that came in at 25%. So only about a quarter of the pups are surviving their first year inside a large protected area. We, we definitely didn't expect that. And then you can see out in management unit 49, we see intermediate pup survival of about 60%. So in terms of what was causing the mortality in Algonquin, um, not a big shocker, the natural causes of death. So the leading causes of death were starvation and strife, and by strife I mean wolves killing other wolves. And actually these two things appear to be related in my mind. So what it sort of seemed like was happening, a lot of the mortality in Algonquin, most of it happened in late summer and early fall. And it seemed like at times 
in some packs, we'd have a few pups would die of starvation and a few would be killed by other wolves. And they may have been related because we think that the wolves may have been essentially staying away from the rendezvous sites where pups are raised longer and longer as they're looking for food. And being away could lead to starvation as the pups aren't getting enough to eat. And being away could also leave them unprotected. Um, and wolves from neighboring packs or dispersing wolves could come through and potentially kill the pups. Outside of the park, um, we see the two leading causes of death being human-caused mortality, which is a combination of shooting, trapping, and collisions with vehicles, and starvation. So why the low pup survival in Western Algonquin? One thing I wanna point out is that I think this result has to be interpreted cautiously. Um, it's a very strong difference that we did see there between East and West Algonquin. Um, and we have a good data set. We did track a lot of pups, but we have to keep in mind these are short-term studies. So we tracked pups largely in Western Algonquin in two main years. And so it leaves open the possibility that maybe those were two bad years for pup survival. So this is an invasive technique, a very intensive technique. And so for a lot of reasons, we don't want to do it all the time. Um, but I think at some point it, it might be worth looking at again, just so we can sort of see, is pup survival always low in Western Algonquin? Or maybe in some years, is it a bit higher? Regardless, unquestionably, um, it was low during the years we studied it. And I guess what we think is going on here, so Western Algonquin, these days is definitely moose country. Uh, we know that there are fewer beavers in Western Algonquin than there are in Eastern Algonquin. Beavers are a really important food source, particularly during summer and fall for, for uh, wolves. And so they can strongly influence pup survival. Um, and actually deer are relatively scarce in Western Algonquin as well, um, certainly relative to Eastern Algonquin. And so as you'll see in a few slides, Eastern wolves are quite capable of killing moose in winter. And we've done some winter predation work to document that. We really don't know much about predation patterns of Eastern wolves during summer. And so it begs the question of whether moose could be quite difficult to kill during summer without the aid of snow, which can really tilt things in favor of wolves. Um, and so perhaps making a go of it, meaning raising your pups in Western Algonquin could be quite tough if you're forced to basically subsist on moose and there are very few beavers and, and not as many deer. Regardless of why it is, low pup survival in Western Algonquin is clearly gonna reduce the ability of Algonquin to act as a really good source population for dispersing Eastern wolves to um, essentially, hopefully establish outside of the park and increase the population. And so again, even if it isn't 25% every year, if we have low pup survival, that means that fewer pups are dispersing out into that unprotected landscape where we'd like to see uh, Eastern wolf density increase and hopefully um, Eastern wolf population growth. And so this low pup survival in the West certainly reduces the ability of Algonquin, Western Algonquin to be a viable source population. Okay, so, you know, I apologize for jumping all over the place here, but I really wanted to kind of give you an overview of all that we learned about wolves and coyotes during, during this research. And so we're gonna switch gears now and talk about the ecological roles of wolves and coyotes within the hybrid zone and a bit about maybe what that means for Eastern North America more broadly. And we're gonna focus on their ecological role with respect to predation on ungulates. And so we had two main questions with this work, and I'm really just gonna hit the high points here, but our first question is, what's the role of Eastern coyotes in Eastern North America? Um, there, there's sort of an idea out there, I think among some people that, well, okay, we don't have wolves anymore, so wolves clearly were um, the, the original top predator or the historical top predator in Eastern North America, but they're largely gone for most of Eastern North America now, and they've been replaced in a sense by eastern coyotes. So eastern coyotes are the de facto top predator across much of eastern North America in places like New England and New York State, for instance. And so there's sort of this idea, I think, among some people that, well, we don't really need wolves because we have a large canid predator. They're filling the role of the top predator and they're filling the role of wolves. And so we wanted to take a look at that and actually ask that question with a bit of data. The second question, unfortunately, we actually 
knew very little before this research, um, and there's still a lot more to be learned about relationships between eastern wolves and their prey. And so the information we do have by the time we started this work was quite outdated. And so there was a lot of work done um, way back when in the 50s and 60s by Doug Pimlot and others. Um, but Algonquin was a very different place back then. So the landscape was a lot more open. There was more unrestrained logging um, and there was a lot more deer. So deer were the numerically dominant ungulate in Algonquin Park during the work of Doug Pimlot in the, in the 50s and 60s, certainly the early 60s. And from that work, they certainly showed that through diet and predation studies that eastern wolves were, were mainly eating deer. And so this idea sort of emerged from there that, that eastern wolves were deer specialists and it sort of got extended and it's often speculated in papers that, well, we have a smaller wolf, smaller than gray wolves, and they're, they have a difficult time killing moose and they're really reliant on deer. More recently, but still quite a while ago, there was some additional work done by um, John Taberge and, and some of his students, including Graham Forbes. And they suggested that, they, they were aware that Eastern wolves could kill moose, but they thought it was relatively rare. And they suggested that perhaps um, Eastern wolves were inefficient moose predators and that a lot of the moose that they ate were actually from scavenging rather than killing. And so the fact remains that we really didn't know what was going on in the contemporary landscape. And so we wanted to, to try to look at it again. And now what we see is a very different Algonquin where the numerically dominant ungulate is no longer white-tailed deer, it's actually moose. And so we wanted to know what, what are Eastern wolves killing and eating during winter on today's landscape and we had to benefit these, these earlier studies. We had a big advantage where we actually had GPS collars now. And so instead of taking all the time to do telemetry and, and get maybe one location every so often, we actually get multiple locations every day. And then we could see where these locations cluster up and actually go out and visit those on the ground. And so by, by visiting these GPS clusters, we're able to find uh, most of the large prey that they killed which in our study system, of course, is white-tailed deer and moose. And so we acknowledge that with this technique, what we're gonna miss is probably a lot of the smaller stuff. We did find small prey, uh, beavers and a few other things, but we can't be sure that we found most or all of the smaller prey, but we do think that we found um, the bulk of the, the large ungulate prey. We did this for 23 packs of varying Canis ancestry, so wolves, coyotes, and hybrids. And here's a quick look. So I mentioned we had 23 packs, but um, four of them were so mixed in their ancestry that they weren't useful for this table. This is showing packs that were either dominated by coyote ancestry or dominated by wolf ancestry. And we had 19 of them. And what you can see is that the, the packs dominated by coyotes, dominated by coyotes, largely are eating deer, but the packs dominated by wolf ancestry eat a much more balanced mix of deer and moose at kills. Now this is actually estimating kill rates um, and this is for ungulates combined. So I'm combining uh, deer kills and moose kills and put them on a standard currency of kilograms of meat um, to standardize it. But basically what we can see from this graph, we've got our ungulate kill rate on the y-axis and then increasing coyote ancestry on the x-axis. So basically ungulate kill rates uh, decline greatly as you get more and more coyote ancestry in a given pack. So that's a, a real short version of our first result there. So the first question, have eastern coyotes replaced the ecological role of wolves? Well, our data suggests no, they don't. Um, they haven't replaced wolves and that wolves and coyotes play very different ecological roles with respect to predation. So coyotes were more flexible in terms of their diet and predation patterns. They could and did exhibit in some cases, high kill rates on white-tailed deer um, and occasionally even killed uh, moose, but they also ate other things. So we had one pack for instance, that had a really small territory centered on a municipal landfill and they killed a few deer during the winter, but mostly they sat around and ate garbage. And we also had another pack of coyotes that was feeding on another human food source. Um, we presume that they were also eating more smaller prey to make up for the lower kill rates on ungulates. Although again, with our technique, 
we weren't able to capture smaller prey. But the bottom line is their predation on ungulates is much less predictable than that of wolves. Wolves rely on large prey and exhibited those higher kill rates on deer and moose, and which was really driven by their higher kill rates on moose, um, I should say. But anyway, wolves rely on large prey um, and aren't as flexible as coyotes in terms of being able to switch to human food or smaller prey. So we didn't, for instance, see any wolf packs or hybrid packs subsisting largely on human food the way we did with a couple of coyote packs. And so what are the implications of all that? Well, I think basically we've got a lot more that we could learn about the ecological roles of these canids. It's, it's a complex topic. But I think what we've seen here with the predation patterns is that we might expect that wolves would be much more stable in terms of their predator-prey dynamics with ungulates because they rely on large prey, so they're predictable. So if they're relying on large prey, if wolves are preying heavily on, on moose or on deer and you start to see that ungulate population decline, then wolves are likely to decline. If the population starts to come back up, then wolves will start to come back up. But they're really gonna track each other Wolves have been shown to have a tight numerical um, relationship with their ungulate prey because they rely on them. But we wouldn't expect to see that necessarily with coyotes. So coyotes are more flexible once again. And so for instance, they can exhibit high kill rates on deer. So if you see Eastern coyotes over a few winters really exhibiting high kill rates on deer and maybe the deer population starts to decline locally, there's no reason to expect that coyotes would start to decline because they could easily switch to, to garbage um, to smaller prey, to other food basically, and maintain their density as their ungulate prey is declining. And so that could lead to a dangerous situation um, where they might destabilize those prey populations because they could continue to eat deer even when deer were at low uh, density. And so for those reasons, we do think that, that wolves and coyotes likely have a different impact on prey populations and the ecological community and that wolves probably represent a more stable, you're likely to see more stable predator-prey dynamics when wolves are the top predator rather than coyotes. For our second question, um, remember we were interested in Eastern wolf prey dynamics and sort of updating what we know about them on the contemporary landscape now that moose are much more common in Algonquin. And so we did see that Eastern wolves prey on deer when deer are available. In fact, we saw that with all the canids. Um, they tended to exhibit high kill rates on white-tailed deer if there were a lot of deer in their territories. But in areas where there weren't a lot of deer, like Western Algonquin, for instance, what we saw is that Eastern wolves were able to prey heavily on moose and exhibit very high kill rates on moose and basically switch. Um, and so that gives us a new understanding of Eastern wolf predation. So as I said previously, it was speculated on that Eastern wolves, because of their smaller size, were inefficient moose predators and probably couldn't exhibit high kill rates on moose. And, and many papers speculated that gray wolves um, would be able to exhibit high kill rates on moose, whereas Eastern wolves could not. And so to kind of look at that, this graph I've got here, basically what this is, all these black dots are kill rates, per capita moose kill rates by wolves, by gray wolves, that have been documented across North America. And so on the the y-axis, we have the moose kill rate exhibited by gray wolves, and on the x-axis, we have increasing moose density. And this blue line shows what's called a functional response. So basically, it's a prediction that as you increase in moose density, wolves are going to kill more moose, but then it'll level off at some point. And that's what you see with this um, asymptotic blue line. What I did was I put our single data point, I added one data point, and that's from Eastern Wolves and Western Algonquin, and that's shown in red, to basically see, well, what do Eastern Wolves do in terms of their moose kill rates relative to gray wolves? And actually, you can see it really follows the prediction of what you would see from gray wolves responding to different densities of moose in terms of how many they kill. In fact, that's a little bit above the predicted line for gray wolves. Um, so that, that really doesn't jive with, with the earlier suggestions and speculation that, that Eastern wolves were somehow incapable of preying reliably on moose. Um, and so that's why I think we, we added a bit of new understanding to the way that Eastern wolves um, uh, prey on, on ungulates in the Algonquin region. 
But again, I'll point out a big unknown here. This is all during winter. So this is winter kill work we did. And we, we really don't know um, too much about their, well, we don't have any kill rates from summer. And so we don't know again, um, how capable are they of killing moose without the aid of snow? Okay, uh, shifting gears once again, and this will be the last sort of chapter, I think in, in the different, um, different database stories I'm telling you here. And this has to do with looking at the spatial dynamics between wolves and coyotes and hybrids um, at the territory level across the hybrid zone. And so if we think about wolves and coyotes, we know that they both exhibit high degrees of intraspecific territoriality, right? So wolves are territorial with wolves, coyotes are territorial with coyotes. That's been shown virtually everywhere they've been studied. However, when wolves and coyotes have been studied in the same areas, what's been found by all the previous telemetry studies is that they actually overlap a very high degree with each other. So 75 to 100%. And the pattern that you see is you see a large wolf territory and you see multiple smaller coyote territories completely within that wolf territory. These coyotes often steal food, scavenge from the wolf kills and they risk aggression when they do so. But it's important to point out that all these previous studies showing this high overlap between gray wolves, uh, between wolves and coyotes is with gray wolves and western coyotes in western North America where the two species are reproductively isolated, right? So they don't hybridize in western North America. They do hybridize in Ontario though. So within our hybrid zone, we asked the question, well, what would be the influence of hybridization on these spatial dynamics between wolves and coyotes? And so we predicted that there would be more intense competition between all canis types. And competition is obviously a big, can be a big driver of territoriality. And so because of the more similar body size, we saw that they are different morphologically, but those differences are relatively subtle, certainly more subtle than the difference between a large Western gray wolf and a small Western coyote. And so because of that similar body size, um, we expect there's intense competition for food, but it's also a hybrid zone, so they're, they're likely competing with each other for mates. So with all this competition, our hypothesis was that unlike what we see in Western North America, in Ontario, we would see wolves and coyotes spatially segregated at the territory level, which would imply territoriality between all canid types. So basically what we're predicting is that when we look at the territories across the landscape, regardless of whether it's wolves, coyotes, or hybrids within those territories, they're all gonna respect each other's territorial boundaries and they're basically all gonna be territorial with each other. And so that, that hypothesis was very strongly supported um, by our GPS tracking data. So these are the, the territories estimated from Algonquin, Kawartha's and Wildlife Management Unit 49. And what I've done here, so each of these polygons is a different territory from a different canid pack. And I think it's pretty clear, but I've um, coded them as either a W for a wolf pack, an H for a hybrid pack, which would mean either they had hybrids in it or they had both wolves and coyotes in it, and a C for a coyote pack. And what you can see is that um, you basically see a high degree of spatial segregation, again, implying that they're all territorial with each other. And really these maps look very similar to maps that you would see from the old wolf monographs where they first um, recognized the territoriality among wolves. And so really we've got strong evidence here that, um, that all the, the coyotes, the wolves, and the hybrids are territorial with each other. So what are the implications of that? Well, certainly it was interesting because we've documented some novel behavioral dynamics between these canids, something we don't see, for instance, in Western North America. But more practically, it's worth pointing out that the Ontario landscape is saturated with territorial canids. And by that, I mean, if you stand anywhere throughout the hybrid zone, you're standing on a piece of ground that's part of a wolf territory, a coyote territory, or a hybrid territory. And so we think this strong territoriality among all canid types could actually serve to reduce the probability of eastern wolves expanding out from Algonquin and exacerbate or increase hybridization. And the reason I say that is because you can imagine, so wolves and coyotes disperse in a solitary manner generally, and so you can imagine a single wolf dispersing out from Algonquin into Wildlife Management Unit 49 or somewhere else in the adjacent landscape, looking for a spot on the landscape to hopefully form a territory and start breeding. 
but the landscape is saturated with other canids. So if it wants to breed, its best option is going to be generally to join an existing pack. And as we saw from the, um, the earlier maps, most of those packs are not other eastern wolves. They're eastern coyotes, they're hybrids, or they're Great Lakes wolves. And so most of this breeding that's going to occur is not going to contribute to eastern wolf population growth. It's going to be hybridization. Um, and so I think, you know, some people might assume or might have assumed that, well, okay, a big wolf comes out, it's just going to displace those coyotes and bump them off their territory and take over. But it's sort of hard to imagine a single wolf, you saw the body sizes, they are bigger, but they're not that much bigger, displacing a pack of say three, four, or even five or more Eastern coyotes or hybrids. So um, starting to wrap up here and, and try to pull all this together um, in terms of what this means for the hybrid zone dynamics and what are the implications for Eastern wolves. Well, we did show that and find that there are Eastern wolves that are resident breeding animals outside of Algonquin, but they're much more rare and they're patchily distributed across that, that unprotected landscape. They also exhibit source sink dynamics, so they survive really well in the park and they survive quite poorly outside of the park. And that keeps them at really low density outside of the park. And at low density, there just aren't a lot of opportunities for Eastern wolves to breed with other Eastern wolves. Instead, again, they're probably breeding um, well, they are breeding in many cases with hybrids or eastern coyotes or Great Lakes wolves, and this leads to a lot of hybridization. And that's a big reason why we see so much hybridization outside of the park and much less hybridization inside of the park, because there's many more opportunities to breed with eastern wolves when eastern wolves are at higher density. We also saw that pup survival was quite low in western Algonquin. So again, this likely limits the ability of Algonquin um, to act as a strong source population for the surrounding landscape because quite simply there just aren't as many pups dispersing out from those packs in Algonquin. And finally we see that the landscape is saturated with territorial canids and again this means that breeding opportunities with other eastern wolves outside of the park are going to be few and far between and often they're going to join existing packs and breed with the other canids that are in those packs. And so unfortunately for all these reasons, um, it certainly looks as if expansion of eastern wolves out from their population core in Algonquin to the landscape surrounding it seems very unlikely under the current landscape and management conditions. And so thinking a bit about eastern wolf conservation, um, in fact, first thinking a bit just about wolf conservation in general, I think if we step away from the Ontario hybrid zone for a second and think about what wolves need, to persist and to have viable populations, it really comes down to two things. And that's an adequate prey base and protection from human caused mortality. And so obviously all wildlife populations need enough to eat, so they need the prey base. And we've seen time and time again that wolves are quite susceptible to human caused mortality. We certainly did a very effective job of eradicating them from most of the US and places in Southern Canada when we put our minds to it historically. And so what we've found more recently though is that they can actually make it a lot of places if they get enough to eat and you, and you give them enough protection from that human caused mortality. But in Ontario, we have a third factor which really kind of makes things a lot more murky and that's hybridization. And in addition to there being a very abundant Eastern coyote population in Southern and, and parts of Central Ontario, which means there's a lot of hybridization um, there appears to be an interaction between human caused mortality and hybridization. And again, that source sink dynamic and the fact that Eastern wolves survive poorly in the unprotected landscape keeps them at low density. And at low density, they're just not likely to find mating opportunities with other Eastern wolves, even if they can disperse out, persist, and find a territory. And so instead, it, it tends to lead to a lot more hybridization. So that begs the question of whether additional protection could be put in outside of Algonquin and perhaps tilt the balance maybe towards Eastern wolves or at least level the playing field a bit. And so the idea here would be to put in additional protection outside of Algonquin, which should certainly increase survival of Eastern wolves. Um, at that greater survival, then you, know, you would hope that they would increase in density 
And then at that increase in density, there should be more mating opportunities with conspecifics with other Eastern wolves. Hybridization could be reduced and perhaps you could start to make gains of more Eastern wolves and actually positive Eastern wolf population growth. And so that seems to be, you know, probably the best strategy towards getting to a place where we could have viable populations outside of Algonquin. And so that's obviously what we're up against when we're thinking about Eastern wolf recovery. And by recovery, I think what we have to think about here is, is expansion both geographically and numerically of Eastern wolves out from Algonquin, right? So they were listed federally and, and provincially because in large part of their current restricted distribution. So we can't just sort of keep the status quo. I think we need to start thinking about where Eastern wolves could be if the conditions were more conducive. And that probably means a broader area of protection. And I wanna qualify that by saying, you know, by a broader area of protection, I'm not talking about across the entire province of Ontario or even very far away from Algonquin. But I think it's gonna take more probably than um, the existing small protected areas outside of Algonquin and, and maybe some small buffer areas around them. Certainly what we've seen time and time again is that small protected areas are generally ineffective at protecting wolves because wolves use large areas and inevitably they step outside of those small protected areas and they often end up shot or trapped when they do. So I think, you know, what I'm thinking about is the area to, to focus most of the recovery efforts on would be essentially south to the Coorthas and the Queen Elizabeth um, wildlands and over to northwest to Georgian Bay and up to Killarney and then back uh, sort of south of Lake Nipissing along the northern border of Algonquin Park to the Quebec border. Um, that's the area I think where the, the recovery efforts would, would be um, most warranted and, and likely most successful, at, at least a place to start. It's complicated though, because it's not as simple as protecting just Eastern wolves. If you're gonna protect wolves in the Algonquin region, you also have to protect coyotes. And again, we saw that they're different morphologically, but traps don't discriminate and it's impossible to reliably ID these animals um, and the time it takes to make a decision of whether to shoot or not. And so if you're gonna protect Eastern wolves, you're gonna to have to protect all canids and that includes coyotes and hybrids. And obviously protecting coyotes is, is not popular, um, not in Ontario and, and not in a lot of places. But I think, you know, if recovery is deemed to be, of Eastern wolves is deemed to be a conservation priority, um, then it's gonna take a broader area of protection outside of Algonquin. And I think we need to keep in mind that if this protection is implemented, this is a process that's gonna take time. It's not gonna happen overnight if Eastern wolves are able to increase in density. Um, we're talking about, it's not gonna happen likely in five years or maybe even 10 years. I think it's a process that would, uh, we'd have to be patient with and it would, it would play out over a longer time period than that. And again, if that protection is implemented, um, then it should be carefully monitored so that we can document and learn um, and do research alongside it and learn and see if it is working. And I'll just wrap up by, by acknowledging once again that, you know, th there's no easy answers here. This is an incredibly complex situation. And really it's that um, those two things that we always need for wolves, which are prey base and adequate protection, but then hybridization is the real wild card here in Ontario and that, that very abundant coyote population in Southern and Central Ontario, um, that, that makes it a difficult situation. And, uh, you know, I think a place to start with recovery is additional protection, um, but it's an uncertain process and uh, it's, it's unclear exactly um, what would happen if, if that was put into place. But I, I certainly think that a prerequisite for a serious attempt at recovery is thinking about additional protection. And with that, I'll just uh, thank our many funding sources, primarily during the, the work that I did, this was mostly came from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. At the time, it was called the Wildlife Research and Development Section. We also got funding from other sections of the MNR and other sources. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and, and tuning in, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.
Oh, thank you so much, John. That picture is adorable. Um, so we'll go ahead and take some questions now. Uh, but first, for those of you who joined after the introduction, uh, we're here with John Benson, and he just finished his talk on hybridization dynamics between eastern wolves and coyotes. Uh, and for those of you with questions, please be sure to type your questions into the Q&A box um, in your control plan, uh, panel. Okay, so here's a question. Um, are there any instances of interaction between eastern wolves, eastern coyotes, gray wolves, and hybrids? Does coyote predation occur by eastern wolves, etc.? Okay, so yeah. I think the question is essentially, are there any aggressive interactions? Um, and if so, yes. Um, so for instance, I documented, uh, we had a, a breeding male of a Eastern coyote pack and he ended up dead and was killed by a neighboring pack of Great Lakes wolves. And um, it was in the area of overlap between their territories. So, they were part of those territorial maps that I showed you. So they were territorial with each other, um, but he was in an area of overlap and, uh, and it was a big pack of, of wolves and, and they killed him. So there was that. Um, we also saw another one. I didn't know the genetic identity of the aggressors, but I, I was watching, I was tracking a female hybrid from a helicopter. And as I was tracking her, all of a sudden we saw two larger canids chasing her and they backed her up against um, this, this really wet, flooded area, and she essentially turned around, had nowhere to go, and the, the three canes were just rolling around fighting. Um, I didn't mean to influence it, but hovering over them with a helicopter may have freaked out the attackers, and they eventually sort of got up and took off. Um, again, I don't know that they were wolves necessarily, but they, they certainly looked larger. Um, so I guess the short answer is yes, um, those interactions are few and far between to actually observe, obviously, um, but it's been my impression. So we showed that territoriality at the, the territory level, and we feel quite confident that that's happening. So um, wolves and coyotes are essentially respecting each other's boundaries on a certain level, but I would not be at all surprised if there were finer level sort of hierarchies and interactions that would probably be played out by, you know, uh, might being right or, or larger canids um, being able to dominate smaller canids if it came down to a fight. Um, so long-winded way of saying, yeah, we saw some of that um, with sort of some lucky observations. Um, and it would certainly be something interesting to look at with the GPS data to try to see if we could see any sort of signal of, um, of wolves maybe exerting some level of dominance at territorial boundaries or something of that nature. Okay, um, next question. Is there any effort underway to repeat the genomic approach of von Holt et al. 2016, but using Ontario canids of known origin according to your parameters? Yeah, so um, a lot of genomics work has been done um, with the same canids that, a lot of the same canids that we're showing here. Um, and so that, that's been going on for a while. And, um, and actually, Linda Rutledge led a paper that was essentially a response to Von Holt and uh, pointed out um, a, few, uh, a few things that, that needed to be thought about. But really, the short story in terms of using genomics to essentially, which I think is part of the question, to validate what we've done here with, admittedly, you know, a relatively small number of microsatellite loci, um, reassuringly, the results seem to be quite consistent. And so the inferences that we made seem to be borne out very much by the genomic approach. And um, actually, uh, Bridget Von Holt and Linda Rutledge and, and a bunch of us are all, uh, we sort of pooled, Brent Patterson pooled a lot of our samples um, because there has been a bunch of sort of debate in the literature about Eastern wolves and about their origins. And so we thought, well, let's try to get all the samples together and see if we can kind of get together and figure it out. And that work is underway and hopefully stay tuned and hopefully there'll be some exciting results uh, in the near future. Okay, um, do wolves kill larger prey because their pack structure differs from that of coyotes? My understanding is that coyotes do not hunt in the same fashion as wolves. 
Yeah, so good question. Um, again, those are in some ways difficult things to observe, obviously, but I, you know, I'd say in, in general, that's probably right that, and the work that has been done and some observations, particularly with Western coyotes, um, has shown that even though coyotes can be predatory, um, yeah, they, they probably don't hunt exactly the same as wolves. So um, a couple things are going on here. One, um, the pack size was smaller for coyotes than it was for, um, for wolves in the hybrid zone. And so pack size plays a role in what they kill. And, you know, I think a lot of people might assume that, okay, more animals means more sort of team effort and killing larger prey. And that's possible, but I think it's more an effect of larger pack means we can kill larger animals and feed more animals, uh, feed more pups, basically. And so I think the larger packs are actually a direct result of killing large prey. If you're killing moose, then it makes sense to keep your offspring with you for another year because you know you're gonna have this huge carcass that the pups can eat off. If you're killing deer and smaller prey, um, then those pups might need to disperse in the first year and go find their own food. Um, so I guess we can't speak too much to the actual hunting style of wolves and coyotes based on our work because we basically went in and looked at the animals when they were already dead. Um, but we do see a difference in pack size between wolves and coyotes. They're, they're essentially living the same way in the Ontario hybrid zone. They're all pack animals, except for the, you know, the dispersing animals or the, the transient animals, but the resident animals are all pack animals, wolves, coyotes, or hybrids. We did see slightly smaller packs in the coyotes. Um, and yeah, and as, as I noted, we saw uh, larger prey being killed more often by wolves. Okay, what do you think the historical pre-Columbian distribution of eastern wolves versus gray wolves was in this part of the world, and what would have been the driver? Moose distribution? Geography? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think anyone knows. So um, I think, obviously, there, and that's something that I got into in the paper that came out of that predation work a little bit is there's uncertainty about the historical top predator in eastern North America. And so the few samples that I'm aware of that have been looked at have shown that there were some eastern wolves um, present, but um, I don't believe there's any evidence, at least to my knowledge, that's actually documented uh, gray wolves or what would likely have been Great Lakes wolves in, say, northeastern North America. Um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't there. And there, there are these sort of anecdotal accounts from early writings um, suggesting that people might have been seeing uh, two different sized wolves. And so it's, it's certainly possible that both eastern wolves and gray wolves of some type were present historically. And, you know, maybe there was some sort of niche partitioning or, or habitat segregation based on prey size or prey type. Um, I honestly don't know. It, it's an interesting question to think about. Um, and of course, there's also the possibility that red wolves and eastern wolves are the same animal, basically, and that we had this smaller wolf um, that basically inhabited deciduous forest up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, from the southeast up up to the northeast, and now we only have them in essentially Ontario and a little bit in Quebec, and obviously the reintroduced population in North Carolina. Um, but I believe those genetic distinctions, although it makes a lot of sense, no question, eastern wolves and red wolves are um, ecologically and genetically similar, um, but there are some genetic differences, whether those differences are driven by isolation and the founder effect of the red wolf population, or because they're actually different animals, um, I really couldn't say. But um, yeah, I guess the, the long answer is that um, it's a pretty confusing subject and no one's really sure. All right, thank you, John. Um, just a couple more. Um, do you ever use the term koi wolf? I don't, um, unless I'm <laughs> telling people that I don't like the term koi wolf, which I do on a regular basis. So. Um, you know, I know that's a, a term that's really caught on and it's popular with a lot of folks and 
and it was greatly popularized, I think, by the um, documentary, which, um, which I was featured in for a small portion. But um, the reason, it's not just, you know, some sort of scientific snobbery or something. I think coy wolf is a term that, um, that can lead to a lot of confusion. It's, an, it's not a precise term. And what, why I say that is that the term coy wolf, it's never clear to me what people are talking about when they say coy wolf. And a lot of times if someone asks me, um, you know, hey, I heard you studied coy wolves, or why don't you say coy wolf, or, you know, are those coy wolves in your pictures? You know, I ask them, well, what do you mean by coy wolf? Are you talking about eastern coyotes, or are you talking about hybrids on the contemporary landscape between wolves and coyotes? And they kind of look puzzled, and, and, and they don't really know. And I think that's the problem, is that, so, for instance, in New England, um, or New York, we have Eastern coyotes, right? It's a big coyote. They do have a historical pattern of hybridization, um, history of hybridization with wolves. And are those the coy wolves? And that's what a lot of people are referring to as coy wolves. So if those are coy wolves, then what are we gonna call the hybrids between Eastern coyotes and Eastern wolves that we see on the contemporary landscape in Ontario? Are those coy coy wolves or, or something else? So I just think, it it makes things a lot simpler and it doesn't introduce all this confusion if we refer to Eastern coyotes as Eastern coyotes um, and we refer to hybrids between Eastern coyotes and Eastern wolves as Eastern wolf, Eastern coyote hybrids or wolf coyote hybrids. Then really everyone knows what we're talking about and there's no confusion. But for instance, in the TV show, um, the, the Meet the Coy Wolf show, they flip back and forth and it's never clear what they're talking about. They refer to coy wolves as the hybrids around Algonquin, and they also refer to them as Eastern coyotes in places where there are no more wolves. And it gives this impression that there's this huge hybrid zone between wolves and coyotes, a hybrid zone that extends into the United States, into New England, and, and even other places, but there's no wolves there, so how could they be hybridizing? They do have a historical pattern of hybridization, but that hybridization is over, and they've essentially homogenized into a population of these larger, coyotes that we call eastern coyotes, but we still do have true contemporary hybrids on the Ontario landscape. So I, I think the terminology is a lot clearer if we avoid the term coy wolf. Thank you for that. Um, next question. How much does the general public in Ontario know about eastern wolves? Is there public support for protecting them? Does it vary sharply rural versus urban? Do many people even know the Eastern wolves are different and how can people help protect them from hunting? Wow, yeah, so um, a lot there and some, some good questions. I guess, first thing I should, I should acknowledge is that I left Ontario and you know I lived up there for about six years doing this research and I left and I've only visited a few times since 2013. So it's difficult for me to know sort of what the, the general public is thinking about Eastern wolves. They've certainly gained a lot more notoriety um, since they've been elevated to threatened, but a lot of that happened after I left. So I have a hard time sort of speaking to what the general public knows and cares about Eastern wolves um, and whether it's, it's sort of a rural urban phenomenon. I, I guess I really can't say about that. I can say that when I was up there, I'd say, people in Ontario were probably more, certainly more aware, and in my study area, um, you know, around Algonquin Park, very much more aware about the fact that Eastern wolves exist um, than they would be in other parts. Still to this day, even among scientists and even among carnivore scientists, um, even among wolf biologists that, that don't work in Ontario, um, there's a lot of folks that they're only vaguely aware of Eastern wolves, I think. And hopefully that's changing with a lot of the research that's been done and some of the conservation attention. But I do think when you step outside of Ontario, it's still a pretty unknown phenomenon. I think a lot of folks would have heard of the red wolf. Um, not as many would have heard of the Eastern wolf. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, I've been, I've been gone now for about, I guess, five years. And uh, I'd be interested to know know the answers to those questions myself. What, what people are saying about Eastern wolves, how much support there is, um, et cetera. So I'm not sure. 
Okay. Um, you stated that there are, uh, does not seem to be any deficiencies in the Eastern wolves, but since they're doing so poorly at avoiding dangers, have there been any cognitive studies done to compare, for lack of a better term, intelligence? Right. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not, and that, that really wouldn't, I'm not sure how, how you would pull that off, I guess, in, unless it was in captivity. And then there's always the question of whether things in captivity translate to the real world. But um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, it's certainly possible that, that there's something cognitive going on. It, it seems unlikely. It seems much more likely that it's something environmental, something, you know, we know that wolves and coyotes learn quickly. Um, and and that when they are naive, they're much more susceptible to things like traps and guns. So to me, that seems like the most um, uh, most intuitive or simplistic explanation. But um, no, it, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any cognitive studies. And um, yeah, we certainly can't rule out that there's something intrinsic about them um, that maybe predisposes them to, uh, to mortality as well. OK, this is the last question. Um, and unfortunately, we just have a lot that I know we can't answer everybody. Uh, but the last one is outside protected areas is competition with bears for prey a factor in canid survival success? Hmm. Um, not to my knowledge, no. I mean, so, you know, the bears in the area would be obviously black bears. And um, I guess there could be some competition maybe for, um, you know, for neonate ungulates, um, which bears would, would prey on, uh, both moose and deer. Um, but black bears generally don't obviously kill adult ungulates and, and eat a lot of vegetation and, and berries and fish and acorns and things like that. So um, I don't think there'd be a, a huge amount of competition that would, that would be driving um, population dynamics of either species, but I don't think it's been looked at either, and, and certainly there could be some competition. Great. Well, we have covered uh, a lot of questions, not all of them. Uh, but John, is there anything else you wanted to cover before wrapping up? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I think I hopefully covered quite a lot. Um, I tried to, like I said, give an overview of, of most of our findings from, from the work that I was involved in. And so, yeah, um, hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully that covered most, most of what I know about Eastern wolves and hybridization. No, definitely, John. And thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. And, uh, and hopefully uh, you'll join us next time. So thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. And thanks for everyone for tuning in.